Καλησπέρα σας. Um, good evening. Greetings, everyone. Thanks again for braving the uh, winter cold and um, turning up tonight. Uh, let's just start with a few household announcements. Um, we're coming up to our midwinter break for the seminar series, so we've got a break for the next two Thursdays, and we're returning on the 18th of July. Okay, so got a chance uh, to rest, recharge your batteries, so... Um, We've got a break for the next two Thursdays and back in um, three weeks' time. So that's the winter break. Um, another thing, um, we always try and um, keep our bookshop at the back fresh. For those who enjoyed re reading Catherine Gauchy's uh, The Embroiderer, we've got her next book, The Carpet Weaver of Ushak, uh, that's available for $30 for sale at the back table. So um, these just have recently arrived. So have a look at the um, uh, table there at the back. Um, also, I'd like to thank the sponsors of tonight's seminar, the uh, Kessler Region Association of Victoria. Um, thank you very much, Kazis, and uh, um, and um, I encourage you all to become uh, sponsors of a seminar of your choice. We still have, um, especially towards the end of the year, quite a few uh, a few seminars to go that don't haven't don't have an allocated sponsor. So, uh, if you'd like to contribute to the seminar series. Um, you might want to consider sponsoring one of those uh, lectures towards the end of the year. Um, I don't think I've got any other announcements. Um, the music night tomorrow is sold out, so if any of you want to go there. Oh, yes, how could I forget the most important one? A few, might be, a few of you might be aware that there's an archaeologist in town, uh, Professor Petros Themelis. Um, you've got um, uh, basically a flyer regarding his visit here. Um, his visit to Melbourne has been sponsored by Papa Flessas, that's the pan Mersenian uh, Brotherhood. Um, he is given a seminar in English and a cocktail party at the Hellenic Museum on Saturday. Um, however, for those who want to hear him speak in Greek, at the Philosophico Café Neo, uh, Monday, um, that's the 1st of July, 6.30, at the Philosophico Café Neo, which is at um, 570 Victoria Street in North Melbourne, the Pan-Arcadian organization Colocotronis, Pan-Arcadicos Silogos Colocotronis, 570 Victoria Street, North Melbourne, plenty of parking around the area. I think the tram just stops off there at Errol Street. Errol Street. So, and he's 6.30 p.m., 6.30 p.m. And for those who don't know um, Petro Stemelis, he's been working on the not just excavation, but also the restoration of ancient uh, Mycenae in the Peloponnese for the last 30 years. So um, I've just recently come back from Adelaide, where I've heard him speak. Um, he, he's quite a um, knowledgeable and um, exceptional sort of person as well. So um, ne that's next Monday, um, 6.30, but at the Pan Arcadian Association House in 570 Victoria Street. So you've all got a flyer there as well, so yeah. Okay, I think we can sort of uh, begin our seminar. Uh, the topic of tonight's seminar is Homer and the Story of the Greek-Australian War Hero uh, by uh, Phil Kafkaloudis, who's also of um, Kazi origin himself. Um, bit of a synopsis. Uh, this seminar comes at the end of Phil's uh, PhD, which is on the writing of a play based on his maternal grandmother, who was a spy in Greece during World War II. Um, she was a resistance fighter, rescuing Australian, British, and New Zealand airmen caught behind enemy, enemy lines in central, western, and northern Greece. His thesis, his thesis compares his storytelling method with that of Homer's Odyssey, noting similarities not only in storytelling modalities, but with the methods of presenting plays in ancient Greece, and thus has a focus on the telling of true stories and the fictional content. Uh, so that's the synopsis. A um, bit of background of Phil. Um, he's got quite a public profile, so many of you will probably sort of know him. At the moment, presently, he's a journalism lecturer and industry fellow at um, RMIT. He's been there since 2017. He's been a radio and TV journalist and has worked for the ABC in South Africa, Vietnam, Indonesia, and many other countries as well. Uh, from, 2015, from 2005 to 2014, he presented the Breakfast Program Radio Australia, which is a breakfast radio show that broadcasts to Asia and the Pacific on FM and the rest of the world on satellite. He's been a regular TV presenter on the ABC TV News Breakfast and co-hosts and fills in as a host on ABC uh, 774. Um, his third book, Someone Else's Wall, which I have um, a copy here, 
tells the story of his grandmother who was a spy in Greece during World War II. He's currently completing his PhD, which is an exegesis, exegesis of, on the, exegesis, sorry. Exeg I know, I know. Exegesis? Exegesis on the process of converting someone else's war into a one-woman play. Uh, a big round of applause for our speakers tonight, Phil Kefkaloubis. Thanks so much for that, Nick. And thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. It's lovely to have you here. Um, was anybody here at the launch of the Greek Film Festival last year? Yeah. Because I, I, I talked then because my grandfather on my father's side was one of the Hidari 200 who were killed in 1944, in May 1944. And the film was quite an emotional thing for me and for my wife, Jackie, who's here tonight, to see this story, yeah, um, and see it put on the screen. And, and my grandfather's name was Christos, and there was a moment in the film where the name Christos, one of the characters, and I went, oh, my God, was that my grandfather? As it was, it wasn't. It was a made-up character, so it wasn't. But when I was doing the launch for the, um, for the film festival... At one stage I said, and on the other side of my family, my grandmother was a spy. And people in the audience laughed. They said, this is just ridiculous. How can you have on one side a prisoner and then on the other side you've got a, um, a spy? And that's her. That's Olga. Olga Mavaramati, Stambolas, which is my grandfather's name, had Sadeki. And I'll go through her story in just a minute. But one thing I'll just tell you at the very beginning with this, that... With Greeks, in fact, the first time I went back to Athens, went to Greece, it was 1988, and I was so excited to be there, I couldn't wait to tell people that I had a grandmother who was a spy. <laughs> and so I went into, late at night, off the old, people remember the old airport that was impossible to get, yeah, yeah, the old airport, right? Um, it's like a domestic terminal, right? But going from the old airport to our lodgings. It was a place called the Hotel Fedra, still exists near the, um, near the placa. And I went in and I was excited and Jackie was with me. We had all our bags and I said to the guy, I don't even know why I did this, but the guy behind the counter, I had to tell someone that I had a grandmother who was a spy in Greece, right? And I said, my grandmother was, hi, Kafka Ludi's checking in. My grandmother was a spy in Greece in World War II. And his response was, Everybody's grandmother was a spy in Greece in World War II. <laughs> and what he meant by that was they were, you know. In Greece, you had to do something. You were either on the good side or the bad side. And there was a good or a bad side. And so everyone was involved. So with everything I'm going to say tonight about Olga, I don't want it ever known or thought that she was the hero because... She did stuff that people were doing right across Greece, that many of you would have relatives of people who were doing things in Greece, rescuing and helping people, saving people, you know, fighting the Nazis, fighting the scourge. You know, they were doing what they needed to do for their country. And we've seen this recently with the financial crisis as well, people just getting on with it and going against all the bad things that have been foisted upon them. So that is the nature of Greece. And what she did was the nature of Greece. And with the people she worked with, there were people who stood to lose a lot more because her family was in Australia. They had their family there. If they were caught, like, have you heard of Leela Karianis? <laughs> Bubalina, the Bubalina cell, who I believe my grandmother worked for, the Bubalina cell. Yeah. What happened to? Her? I'll talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Wait for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'll go forward 45 minutes. Okay. No. So. Yeah. <laughs> let's do the beginning first. But there were people she worked with who had everything to lose, and if they were caught, they would not just die, but their families would die. We were talking about an opponent that was pretty horrible in a lot of ways. You know, there were. There were good Germans, there were bad Germans. But we know, like with Distimo, with the horror of Distimo, that if you were caught, 
doing something that they took exception to, a lot of innocent people would die. So, that said, let's move on to Olga's story. I'm very pleased to, I want to say thank you to the Castellorian Association of Victoria. Thank you so much um, for sponsoring this talk. It's really, really great. I also want to pay tribute to, I've got a couple of people here tonight. Um, this is part of a PhD that I'm doing, converting a novel that I've written that was published in 2011 that Nick was talking about uh, and converting it into a play. And this was going to be a PhD just about adapting the novel into a play. That was going to be it. But I asked somebody to be my supervisor and I looked up history professors and the name of Chris Mackey came up and I asked Chris, would he be, and many of you know Chris, I know, um, I asked, would he be part of it? Would he be my supervisor? He said, yeah, it'd be great. Okay, I'd love to do it. Never done a PhD like this one before, but I'll do it. And right from the word go, he said to me, why did you tell the story of the Odyssey through your grandmother's story? And I said, I didn't. And then almost from that moment on, the story became entwined with the ancients because what happened with Olga was similar to what happened to Odysseus in the Odyssey. And it took Chris to sort of make me realise that. And the first thing he got me doing was reading the Odyssey. And I went, oh my God, the similarities are amazing in Olga being trapped in Greece, away from her family for so long, not able to get back. First because of the, uh, the underground and then the British training her and then the Italian invasion, then the, Gre and then the Germans invading. And so all of these things kept stopping her. They were impediments to her getting back, the same thing that happened with Odysseus. But I'll go through that now. That is my grandmother, Olga Mavromati, also known as Olga Hatsidaki, also known as Olga Stambolis. Now, my grandmother, she was born in Athens and was a foundling, like so many other children, women were not considered very, or considered very highly by certain parts of Greek society at the time. Considering it's a matriarchal society and we all love our mothers, don't we? Yeah. It was so interesting, she was given away by her mother in Greece. She was so lucky she landed on her feet because that woman with her mother had Sadeki was a seamstress who worked in Alexandria. And what a city to be brought up in. The worst of times, the best of times. The worst of places, the best of places. Because Mother Hatsideki was a woman who sewed clothes for the royal family, and so they would do the trip to Athens, and they would be making clothes. She would mix Olga with the royal princess. It was a pretty, pretty privileged position to be in. And the best thing about this relationship was Mother had Sadeki encouraged Olga to do whatever she wanted. So, living in Alexandria, which was the Shanghai of the Middle East, she had to learn six languages, and she did. She was encouraged to be an actor, and she did acting. I don't know how good she was, but she encouraged her to do stuff. She wanted her to go to university. In Australia, that was unheard of in 1916, 1917, but in Alexandria, that's what she wanted. So there was my grandmother. This young girl landed on her feet with, as a foundling and did very well. And you can see there, this is a, a shot. That's my grandmother over there on the very left. I look at these women. I can't actually tell which one was Mother Hatsudeikin because they all look pretty similar to me, but I'm assuming it's her. And look at that as a scene for Alexandria. It's on the beach. You've got people, you've got a soldier in the background, you've got people dressed in Western gear there as well. There's a horse back there. There is a donkey you can barely make out as well. This is so Alexandria. And people on a beach dressed from toe to top, you know? Interesting place to grow up, indeed. She became an actor, and this is a very old photograph. This is when she was a teenager. This X was done by my mother about 40 years ago to say, that's my mother. And there she was as a young girl in this young acting troupe. And when she eventually came to Australia, she stayed 
working as an actor, yeah. and in fact later took her children into some of the roles that she did. But there she is. This is the sort of thing that happens when you mix girls with really forward-thinking mothers. This is probably 1919, 1920, wearing brogues, wearing pants, legs crossed like that, cigarette, hat, you know, how very unfemale this was. But what a great look, isn't it? I'm so proud of her when I see that. She was, you know, she really had attitude. And from what my sister tells me, my sister is much older than me, um, sorry sis, but she remembers Olga well and says that was the sort of character she was. She was such a strong, she wouldn't take any nonsense from anybody. But this comes right from those early days in her life. So, what was that? Okay, what like that when she was young. Yeah, okay. Oh, really? Oh, okay, cool. But what happens? There's, you know, her life is set up to be a really interesting, open person, to do anything she wants. This man comes, this old, old man who was about 15, 20, 15, 20 years older than her, comes. He's a Kazi. He comes. He asks, he finds out about Olga, this, this, how he finds out about Olga, I don't know. She's in Alexandria, she's not a Kazi, but he comes to Alexandria, he's heard about her, and he asks her to marry him. Mother had Sadeki apparently said, don't get married, go to university, do whatever you want. But the thing of children, you know, she was what, 17, 18, the grass is always greener, life is always greater on the other side of the world, in Australia. And he comes to her and he says, I have a seafood, I had a seafood restaurant in San Francisco after the earthquake. I have a seafood restaurant in Australia. Come marry me. He didn't have a seafood restaurant. He had a fish and chip shop. <laughs> Greeks, Greeks, right. So. Fish and she goes, oh, seafood restaurant, Australia, great. So what happens? She marries him. She thinks, first of all, he's an old man. I don't really, you know. But in the end, she goes, well, you know, she marries him. He's a reasonably good-looking guy. And so what happens in about... This is taken 10 minutes later, right? OK. <laughs> There's all these... The kids come out. There's my grandfather. There is Nikki. There's my mum, beautiful young girl, her sister Frida, my sister, my, my auntie Tina, and Olga. Now, they, they made a beautiful family, right? But something happens in that family. There were four children in that shot. They had a fifth child. And this is the tragedy of this family, and it's the thing that led Olga to do what she was doing. This child, Olga got a letter from her birth mother in Greece saying, we are your parents, come back, see us. And Olga had to convince Michael, can I go? I want to go back, I need to meet my mother. As anybody who's ever been not who doesn't know their, their birth mother, you want to know. And she wanted to know. So she took her child, Christopher, who's not in that shot, and my mother, and went back to Athens to meet her family. Her family, when they met her, my mum on the boat going over made a little cloth dog to give to her grandmother. She gives the little cloth dog that she made to her grandmother. Her grandmother looks at it, tosses it away and says, have you got money? <laughs> sounds familiar. Yeah, sounds familiar. It still happens, does it? <laughs> Good. Okay. So breaking the heart, my mother's heart, and she remembered until the day she died how horrible that feeling was that she wasn't valued. And Olga, who I never knew, I assume it was the same thing for her. On that trip back, the baby, Christopher, dies. Now, it just so happens with all these beautiful kids, Christopher was Michael's favourite. He adored Christopher. 
that was the end of the marriage. They tried to make it work. They came back to Australia and tried to make it work, but it couldn't. It just didn't. So in a moment of great depression, I believe, Olga left again, went to Greece to try and sort her life. Leaving the children with Michael, she went to Greece. That's when she got caught up and the, um, the British found out about her, trained her, then the Italians invaded, and then the Germans invaded, and she worked in the deep underground. Now, the spy thing that she did, <coughs> what she did was, this photograph is really an important photograph in her story because I could not place that photograph and what she was wearing. On the back it says, Olga in British uniform. I went around Greece in a research trip for this PhD 18 months ago. We went from Athens, we went around to Yanina, we went up through all the places that the underground worked and where the British had strongholds, and then over to Thessaloniki. And everywhere I went, I tried to identify what uniform she was wearing, and nobody in the military museums, um, in a couple of places. We went to a, a whole range of places, didn't we, to try and identify that uniform. You know in the end where we got it identified? Anyone watch The Simpsons? Yes. You have to watch The Simpsons, yeah. You, it, you don't leave here and go and watch The Simpsons. It's great, right? But um, The Simpsons has this character, it's the comic book guy, right? He's got his head in a ponytail, right? And he just knows everything about every comic ever. We went into a surplus shop just outside of Thessaloniki, and there was a guy there, I think he even had a ponytail. And I said, I said, can you identify this? Oh yes, I can identify that. That is Greek naval uniform, uh, 1941. Um, he identified the whole thing. And I said, what about the shirt? He said, no, that's part of the Greek naval uniform. I can tell from the shape of the collar. I went, wow, you guys really know your stuff. And so from that, it was Greek naval uniform. And then, you can't see it so much in this shot, but there's a line about there in the original. And that's when I assumed, I didn't know where this was taken. It looks like it may have been taken at sea. That's my surmising of it. She's in Greek naval uniform, perhaps because I then later found out that the cell that helped these flyers who were trapped in Greece get out of Greece. They were assisted by this Bubalina cell, Leela's cell. They were not only rescued through the enemy lines, they were also accompanied to Cairo, to the British stronghold in Cairo. I believe, I think, I surmise, that maybe that photo was taken on the boat. She's in the uniform, maybe. I don't know. Sorry? Shop in Pires. No. Sales. Yeah. Okay. Uniforms and hats and decorations. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like that sort of shop. It was the same thing. Yeah. It's called. Okay. It's very close to the harbour in Pires. Right? Oh, okay. And uh, they can give you information. All right. I okay. serve in the Greek Navy. Ah. We had a chef. Yep. English. Uh, Produced, but it was blue. So we don't know what that one was. Well, so I'm not too sure. It looks light though. Greek yeah. Navy yeah, interesting. We had chefs in the Greek Navy. But you wouldn't have been serving in 1941 though, would you? Much no, too young. No, no, much too young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but again, Greeks, you know, they look good. As they say, you know, dark skin doesn't crack, you know. So you could be 106, you know. That's. You know. <laughs> 83. 83, wow, okay, cool. Don't hide my <laughs> okay. So this is what Olga did. She helped to get people out of Greece, to get them, get these flyers to safety. And what was extraordinary about this was that she had to go back across enemy lines, back across through the, um, through the Germans, through the Italians, to get to people who were stranded and caught and get them out again. It was extraordinary what she, and not just her, but Bubalina, um, Leela herself was caught 
At the same time, and this is another thing I've found, she was doing exactly the same work that Olga talked about. So that's why I believe that she worked for Leela, or worked in Leela's cell. Leela was caught, Olga was caught. Olga was caught in 1941, about the middle of 1941 by the Germans, and they interrogated her, and they interrogated Leela, but they interrogated Olga, and Olga, being an actor, was able to fool them. She could also speak German. So when they spoke to her and they asked her, did you, what were you doing, are you, are you a spy? They just asked the, the general question, no, I don't know what you're talking about. No, she put on a persona of being a fishwife. And at one stage, the way that I have written this, my mother told me the story, and I've written the story pretty closely to how my mother told it, that she was sitting there, didn't tell them anything, and then they, the two German interrogators went to another, on the other side of a petition and talked and said, look, we will find out if it's her if we ask her this question. If she answers this way, we know it's her. If she answers it this way, then we've just got a dumb fishwife. So she did the dumb fishwife. And they almost let her go. They still jailed her, but they didn't kill her. So she spent six months in jail in Averroff Prison. Which is, where is Averroff Prison? Averroff Prison is on the road north out of Athens. It's actually in Athens. It's on the main road out, I think towards Pendeli, but it's not far. Okay. It's now a development or something now, isn't it? Does anyone know oh, what? No, no, it's, still jail. it's still a jail. All oh, right. It was in the, in the lower, lower parts. So she and Leela were both jailed around the same time. The difference was she was released. They got her out, and they got her out in the middle of the famine. And, and I told a story, I told it this morning on ABC to, uh, to Raph Epstein, that when she stepped out of the jail, she stepped out to dead bodies. She stepped out to the horror. And when I was telling this story at a launch for my novel at the War Memorial in Sydney, a man was standing there looking at me. And he was just looking almost angry. And he was looking at me like this. And then I was signing books, and he got in the queue, and he came one, and I went, oh no, I've written something wrong in the book, because he was really cross. And he came right up to me, and I said, do you want me to sign a copy of your book? He said, no, I've read your book. And I want you to know that on the day that Olga got out of prison, I was there. And that's exactly how it was. <laughs> I went, that's good, isn't it? Yeah, great. And so, and it was, it was a wonderful moment in my life. I was expecting him to come and kill me, but he didn't. He told me something that was so affirming, it was lovely. But I didn't have the heart to tell him I had made it up, right? But what I had made up was based on what Olga said had been there when she got out, but also the situation around Onomos at the time. So it was... It was something, my best guess, and it just happened to work. But the thing is that with, with authors, with novelists, you write 20% of the story. 80% of it is people's minds and their imagination. And he remembered, reading my words, he remembered what he knew. So it wasn't me. I just gave him the spark to remember. OK. Now... While she was in jail, her family, her husband, the Kazi guy, had her declared dead. He hadn't heard from her. She was a spy. Had her declared dead. He remarried this woman. The opposite of everything that Olga was. She was the only grandmother I have ever known. And she was wonderful. She was a loving beautiful woman, but was, didn't have Olga's beauty. She was Scottish and Irish and totally different. But she was a listener and a really great grandmother. They married. They had two children in quick succession. He was a bigamist. Well, he thought she was dead. He thought she was dead. And he had her declared dead. Hadn't heard from her. No one knew anything about her. He didn't do it 
thinking I'm doing it because I'm going to be a bigamist because now I'm going to marry this woman. He thought she was dead. And he had three daughters and a son who needed a mother. So my auntie Tina, my mother, and Frida, who was the second oldest. You can I, see the resemblance between Olga and her daughters. Yeah, you can. Striking. You certainly can. Yeah. And she was a great mother to them, by the way. Um, but yeah, they did have a really tough time being away from their mother. So Olga gets out of jail. She's doing some more work. And in the way that I've written the story, there comes a point where she now starts to think about coming back to Australia. She has done enough. She has validated herself enough. She's thinking, I'm going back to fight for my children. I'm going back. And then she hears that her husband has married again and has had two more children. If he hadn't had two more children, she probably would have gone back, kicked Jean out of the house and said, he's mine. But there were two more children, two little boys. What can you do? Her choice was to stay. She stayed. And as the war finished, she worked for the Americans. I don't know what she did, but she worked for the Americans and didn't come back to Australia until 1952. And as she is on the boat coming back to Australia, Michael, her husband, has a heart attack and dies. They never see each other again. 1936, she leaves him. 1937, leaves him. 1952 he dies, she never sees him again. She comes back and reunites with her family. My mum was the one, my mum, a very shy girl, was the one who gave her the hardest time. She actually wrote a letter which said something like, Mum, I hope you are well. How could you leave us? How could you leave us in this situation? Um, but all that is forgotten you know, in that passive-aggressive Greek mother type thing, right? All this is forgotten. I hate you, but that's forgotten, you know? <laughs> so she's, do she's doing this passive-aggressive stuff, and in the end she said, I hope when you come back and you see Dad, I hope you do not make it hard for him because it's only right that we side with the, man with the parent who brought us up. So Olga had this to bear as well. But as people have said, she left her children. Why did she leave her children? Well, my mum remembers one thing when she was a little kid in 1937. Christopher had died. Michael was very quietly, obviously blaming her with every pore of his body, but trying not to, because he knew what she was going through. One night, Olga got the children, put them into the front of the truck, from their little fish shop in Ultimo in Sydney and drove them towards a cliff. Michael jumped on the car and stopped it. Now, would she have driven the kids off a cliff? We're talking about a depressed woman. I don't know. But my mother always believed that she left because she now felt that anyone who could be that low as to hurt her children could not possibly stay in that situation. So did she make the braver decision just to leave until she could sort out why she could go this far? Well, everything I've told you today is oral history, right? This is the stuff that my mum and my aunties told me and the daughter of Nikki, who was the boy who was on the lap of my grandfather, how to go about telling this story. And I wanted to tell this story. I'd heard about it all my life from the Easter's Christmases and Easter's and my mum and my aunties would tell me the story. How do I go about telling this story when I have nothing but oral histories, really? Well, I had a few other little things too. Homer, and thank you, Chris, Homer had the same problems. He couldn't go duck down to the library and look up what Achilles did, where was Achilles born and, you know, everything. He couldn't do that. It was oral history. Stuff was given to him. There were no libraries then, were there, Chris? Good, thank you. Great. Whew, that was great. So he had to rely on oral histories. And we don't even know if there was a... Well, we 
I think it's pretty much a given now. We know there was a Troy and where roughly Troy was. I think you've been there, Chris, haven't you, to Troy? You've been to Troy. Is it Troy? Did they have a big sign saying, welcome to Troy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> so how do we know any of these things are true? How do we know Achilles even existed, let alone being the son of a god? You know, when is it myth and when is it true? This is an issue. And this is the issue that we had for the father of history, Herodotus, who wrote histories. And he couldn't duck down to a library because his was the first book in the library. You know, it's really difficult to know what to do. Cicero called him the father of history for writing histories. But if you ever, who has read histories or part of histories, yeah? There are elements in there, isn't there, where he talks about the way people thought and why people, when they got up in the morning, they decided to do a certain thing and why they decided to do it. Where did that come from? I think it came from the brain of Herodotus making a really good guess. And that is why Plutarch called him the father of lies, because it's not all true. It is him telling a story. And the story, the Persian Wars were happening when he was a young, young, when he was young, but he had people tell him the story. And he even says at one point, I know it's true because the people involved told me themselves. It is still oral history. And we all know the thing with Chinese whispers. If I said something to you and we passed it all on, by the time we got to the end, it would be totally different. So this is the issue with oral histories and in storytelling. And that was my problem because my mum was telling me what her mother told her. And in the translation and telling stories at family gatherings over so many years, how could it have been changed? They would tell me a story. I had them all around a table, my Auntie Tina, Auntie Frieda and my mum. Around a table, they would tell me a story and then the story would be different from each of the three. They were all told the same story by their mother, but in the end, it's different. My mum tells a story about how Olga was in a queue at the bakery and they saw a collaborator, three people in front. She waited until the collaborator got their bread, got out, followed him into a lane, then stabbed him to death. My, and I went, wow, this is great stuff, and I'm writing this down. And then I went, wow, okay, good stabbing death, right? God, it was good. And then Frida says, no, 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 no. It wasn't. It was a butcher shop. Olga was with another underground resistance worker, and together they grabbed the guy after he went back into his house and they shot him. OK, no stab, but shot. And then Mum would go, no, no, it was stab. OK, it was stab. No, it was shot. Oh, God, thank you. And then Tina, who's very quiet, is going, nah, no, 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 it happened in Paris. And <laughs> what? It happened in Paris? And again, it was some other kind of merchandise shop. I don't know what it was. But everybody had a different version. This is the problem. What if there are three different stories? Three. Well, that's right. I could have done three different versions. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, perhaps. Who knows? Who knows? So, how could I avoid being called a liar? I'm a journalist. I've been a journalist since 1983. I didn't want to be called a liar. So what I did, I decided, and I remember I, I met an older journalist I'd worked with, and I said to him, I, I want to tell her story, but I don't know all the facts. And he said, do it as a novel. And that was the most liberating thing, because then I could do what Herodotus did. I could do what Homer did. I could get inside her mind and try different things. And that's what I chose to do with this novel. And it seemed to, be, seemed to work OK. What I did, I gathered my oral histories and used every bit of research knowledge I had to get the crossover points in the oral histories, which cut out a lot of stuff, by the way. I then did historical research, memoirs. Uh, anyone heard of Brigadier Eddie Myers? Eddie Myers, he worked in the... Chris, yes. He worked in the for the SOE, for the British, and he was... Um, a person who 
uh, was involved in getting Eads and Elas together, which was a hard thing to do, and getting the Gorgopotamus Bridge blown up and a whole lot of other things too. So I read memoirs, so I got as much of this stuff as I could. What surprised me when I was doing this research was how little history about the war in Greece there was. Everybody's talking about Tobruk, they were talking about North Africa, Battle of Britain, the Blitz, Pearl Harbor, Singapore, all these other theatres of war. Greece, which was probably the most important theatre of war. And I say that because when Mussolini invaded Greece and got pushed out in one of Greece's greatest moments, forced Hitler to invade Greece to save face for Mussolini. Hitler was going to invade Russia. He had to put off the invasion of Russia until winter. The invasion of Russia in winter changed the war. It was his first major defeat and he never recovered. It's argued, it could be argued. It's argued. Arguable. Arguable. Yeah. We don't know. We don't know. Maybe it wouldn't have. Yeah, who knows. But this is what one of the big things about this. Historical research, this important war was not, did not have as much information about it as we see with many of the others. I spoke with people who were there, including my father, who worked in the resistance. His father was the man who was one of the Hidari 200, and I spoke to him about it. He and Olga never actually met in Greece, but he worked with the underground. He was only 16, 17, and Olga was working in a different theatre of the underground. So there were people I spoke to who were there. I spoke with people who knew Olga, including my sister, gathered as much information about her type of character as I possibly could. Travelled to Greece a lot. That must um, have been tough. Sorry? That must have been tough. Going to Greece, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, I know. And at times had to go to Santorini too. Oh, God. <laughs> No, oh, that was terrible. We ended up getting married there, didn't we? Just to justify the trip, you know? Anyway, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Tom. Okay. Um, I looked at what Olga had left behind, and she left behind a few things. Family documents. This document, this document is interesting. This is from the legation of the United States of America, dated 1941. This was just before she was jailed. I had these documents, unfortunately, to my shame. My mum wanted me to learn Greek and I didn't. I'm learning now, but I didn't at the time. I got, my father translated these documents. And from these things, and this is the joy of fact checking, the joy of journalism, you look at these documents, look at things such as the dates. It has dates. It has that she worked for the US. It has where she worked and what her roles were, and I have a name. So all of these documents, she left about 20 documents. There were passes, but I was able to pinpoint where she was, but not enough to make it a factual story. She also, this document was a document that she submitted to the British. She had been left a house in Pendeli by an ambassador she worked for. When she was arrested, thrown into jail, the Nazis took over her house. Pendeli, you been to Pendeli? Anyone here been to Pendeli? You know, it's not a, bad, not a bad spot, is it? And she had this huge house with all these little things, a lace bed quilt, double bed in those days, hand towels, a bathing gown, all of these little things, a coffee mincer, you know, lots of different things. Six old paintings, which she put a value of, what is it? 18 pounds on six old paintings. I wonder what those paintings were. But these are all things that were disappeared from her house. She got back, the house was a shell. And so, I know, during her imprisonment in 1941 at Pendeli, uh, the, the house in Pendeli, these are the sort of documents that we have that I could trace, I could put the story back together again. There were letters. This is a letter from her son. Um, Nicky, who became deaf when he was six, and he was able to give me an insight into the family in Australia. Then this little baby, it was a manuscript about that thick, and I dreamed that this was her memoir. And we've got a friend, Jackie's an actor, 
And one of our friends is, you know Maria Mercedes? Yes. Actor? She's a friend of ours. She was one of the ones, along with Jackie, encouraged me to write this story. Maria said, write the story, we'll make it into a movie, and I'll play your mother. You know, she's Greek. She's always looking for a gig, right? Always looking for a job. And I said, OK, Maria, I'll do it. You translate. I'll translate it. It'll be good. You sure? You... I'll translate it. Don't you worry. This was written on tracing paper. It was 1948. On both sides in pencil. Now, it looks like you can kind of make it out. You can see the other side coming through there. And I'll never forget when I first gave it to her to translate, she went, OK, I'm ready to go. Let's go. Ready. ready. OK. I said, I'll put the coffee on. Yep, that's good. I'm ready to go. It was a... So oh, I can't do this. And, she, and that was it. That was it. That was, that was as far as she got. And then my father translated it. And it took him ages, but he translated it. And it was just a love story. It had nothing to do with her, nothing to do with what Olga had done. It was of no value at all as far as the war. It was written in 1948. It was just her attempt to be a novelist. Uh, it doesn't matter, that was my grandma. And in fact, on the cover of the book, you can see a bit of writing there. That's from the manuscript. That's her writing. I think, oh, well, I've got, at least I've got a bit of handwriting out of it. But I really wish she was a better writer. But anyway, I'm not going to say that. Now, at this point, I've got this information. But what I don't know is this. What if she's just made this all up? What if she didn't rescue a single person? What if... She had watched other people, and you see this in war. She had seen other people be brave and strong, and she is mimicking them, right? And who says that can't be right? I needed to know she didn't do that. Enter the unknown pilot. One day at the shop in Ultima, it was in the evening, this pilot turns up, knocks on the glass, and says to, the person he says it to, is, oh, da, da, oh, I didn't realise it was so far back, uh, Jean, and says, I have a, this is when they all think that Olga's dead, I have a message from Olga for Nelly, my mum. Jean says, Words to the effect, oh my God, is she alive? Yes. Okay, and she went to get mum. My mum didn't want to know. She said, I don't want to know. You know, because she saw, she knew what this would mean for this family. No, I don't want to know. Jean, to her great credit, said, you've got to see this man. Your mother is alive. She went... And my mum refused. Jean went back to the man and said, she won't see you. And he told her at some stage in that, Olga rescued me. And she said to me, if I ever get back to Australia, here is the address, go and tell my daughter I'm alive and whatever the rest of the message is, I don't know. That's how I know her story was true. Because the soldier the pilot came and told the family that he she had been Aussie. rescued. Sorry? He was an Aussie. He was an Aussie. And how much of his story did, did, did you get the full story or just... No, no, because the message was simply for, simply for Nellie. And she just had to... I really wish she'd spoken to him. OK, the unknown pilot. So, here we go. Just checking out the time. OK, it wasn't enough. I didn't have enough for a factual book. So, I wrote the novel. And I put on the front, I made sure it was published with a novel on it. I didn't want people getting confused about whether it was a factual book or not. It was taken up by Sikolios Publications. And they did a beautiful job. Looks a bit Downton Abbey, doesn't it? You know, a little bit. But, you know... It still is pretty beautiful. That certainly isn't my grandmother. But... Apolimos, tis olios. So, Olga's War. And again, they, to their great credit, they used her handwriting there. 
but it was a, they did a beautiful job with it. But it was still a novel. Now, for this PhD, I said a play, right? This is a scene where Olga is a child and we have three actors there. One of them is my wife, Jackie, who's sitting there in the middle playing. She's, um, Jackie's background as an actor is quite a long-standing one. In fact, she was always been the person who was meant to play Olga because first thing my dad said when he saw Jackie was, you look just like her. And, and there, was, there are similarities in the shape of the face and all that. And am I going to get into trouble later? For the, no, OK, good. Um, Stephen May, Hannah Fredrickson, both well-respected actors. It's a three-hander play. It was originally going to be just a one-hander. And we ha was going to have Olga as a memory piece. So it's set 17 years after the novel finished. And what I've had is her memoir, her diary from the war, is given, sent back to her. And she is remembering everything of the war. These people are memories. She is acting with them to the point. This is the workshop we did in January. There they are. She and Stephen are on their first mission together and they are watching for Germans, a German nest, and they're hiding. The workshop was done on book, which means they were reading the lines as we did it. It was all recorded. And the PhD, when we submit later this year, will have a recording of that workshop included. It was recorded at RMIT using six cameras. And um, I think it's come out very, very well. Um, so the next stage for this piece is to take it to theatre companies. But we'll see. We'll see what happens with it. I was very pleased with the, um, with the way it worked. And we found some parallels between Olga's story and um, this is what Chris was bringing up before. He said, you know, look at the similarities. Yeah, Odysseus. <laughs> Fighting for survival. It's about finding your home. It's about the struggle to achieve. It's about how life goes on behind, beyond each target in your life. And that's how it goes for both. It's about good versus bad. It's about protecting your family. And it's also about having a ripping adventure, which is what the Greeks do really, really well. But the big parallel for me was the fact that Homer and Herodotus had the same problems I had. They had oral history. I had more than they had. But it was a story I thought that had to be told. And at every stage of getting to the play, I was aware that I did not want to mislead people. Stuff I made up, but the story is true. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Phil. That was sort of uh, quite, uh, quite impressive. And um, um, the floor is open to questions. Just raise your hand and I'll come around with the mic. And, um Yep. Jackie, I've had a request for you to raise your hand. Everyone wants to see if you look like Olga. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask, um, how old were the children when Olga left them? And um, did I'll answer that first. <laughs> um, they were very young. They were four, well, the youngest would have been two five, six, oh, in fact, when she left the second time, when she actually did leave, 14, 13, 10, and eight. Was there another man? No, not that I know of. Right, so she left. I don't think, if yeah. she left for another man, I wouldn't even write the story. I'd go, <laughs> I'd go, it's going to be really hard to make her sympathetic if she went off just to, you know, have a bit of sex with somebody, you know what I mean? But no, I think when my mum told the story about that she was at such an ebb after the death of Christopher that she was considering suicide and maybe the children as well. And we're seeing this every day. It's played out in Australia in every town. We're seeing it 
every month there's a murder suicide that you know depression you know and you didn't tell us what happened to Olga in the end. Oh, okay. My did. book is for sale and oh. it's... <laughs> <laughs> no, what happens, she comes back 1952 and um, she lives to 1960. And she died of an aneurysm and it was a very fast one. It was a... Um, it was a tear in the heart. And what the coroner said to my mum was, it could have been something in there. My Olga used to have a little, she had something in her arm, it was a bit of shrapnel, and she used to do this, look at the shrapnel, you know, it was like a little war, war medal, the only one she ever got. And my mum always suspected that it, some part of it got into a bloodstream and just tore her heart, because her heart was torn, broken, maybe, yeah. Um, my comment is more about um, the honesty when you write your history, your memoirs. And I suppose the thing, there's this, shop, there's, there's this book that's been out a while about the shopkeeping phenomena, the Greek shopkeeping phenomena, and I get so annoyed with that. They're, I hope no one's here, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but there's, there was a very dark side to that, the, to the shopkeeping phenomena that really needs to be told. But they've made this beautiful picture book about it. It was all beautiful, all good stories. And much the same the other night on TV, there was um, a new show happening on SBS about, it's a take on where do you think you are? And they went to Ingham. And it was about the Greeks and, and the Italians. It was focused on the Italians. And all the Italian families that were interviewed said, look, yeah, we might have had it a little bit hard, but, you know, it was pretty easy settling. That's rubbish. You know, my father wrote his memoirs of Ingham in the 1920s. They were and I've still got them, they were treated like dirt. It was horrible, horrible, horrible. And I, I just, the way you're, at least you're honest about, you know, things happen in families, it's not a perfect ride, is it? There's no. mental illness, there's, you, I think we've just got to be honest in the way we tell yeah. history. We can't revise it. No, I think you're yeah. right. I mean, there are things that I suspect within my family I didn't write about, but again, I think it would be taking it a step too far to do that. Um, but every family's got bad stuff. You know, it just is. Not everybody is ex happy. Chris. Phil, uh, can you be sure that she wasn't recruited from Australia to do what she did? Recruited from Australia? Yeah, because I think there she, was a, there was was a period. Perfect with the languages that she knew. And the fact she didn't have any yeah. family there except for her fake mum and who cares about her. But it was... Um, <laughs> but... It's a possibility. I doubt it. I think um, she wouldn't have gone over there to do that kind of thing. I don't think... And there was a number of years between her arriving and her doing that work, as far as I can tell. So it's a possibility. Well, that's an interesting thing I hadn't thought about. Uh, so no mention of the Greek Civil War, because she came in 52. Yeah, so now she worked after the after the war, she worked for the Americans. She worked for a man called um, John Emil Purifoy. And Purifoy was the ambassador, ambassador, the ambassador, who died himself in mysterious circumstances in Thailand, where his car crashed and his... There was a correspondence. She worked for him for quite a long time. And um, there was correspondence that I have um, between his wife and Olga. And she continued, his wife continued to send letters to my auntie Frida, and I have those as well. They, they were very close. And according to my auntie Frida, that she worked for the Americans in some capacity, and that was during the Civil War. What? I don't know. Otherwise, I would have written the sequel by now. I can probably go without that. Yeah. Oh, OK. I've got three points I'd like you to cover, Phil. First of all, wonderful life, and I think it's tragic in Greece's, or the second largest Greek city in the world, that so few people have turned up. Uh, I think everyone should try and encourage your friends to turn up to these events, because this is so precious, this is really given. So the first thing is, in that photo of your grandmother and your grandfather, yeah. she's 17 years old, you said he was twice as age, 34. Yeah. She is a dominant person. If you look at the body language, she's focused, she's centred, and he's just subordinate to her and totally adapted with her. So I'd like to talk about that one. <laughs> the second thing is, at that time, Greek culture was very conservative. It'd be almost impossible for a Greek woman to leave a family. Yeah. Would you put that to her growing up in 
Alexandria in a cosmopolitan city where she was way ahead of, say, the traditional Greek wars and cultures. And the third thing is, when I was in Greece many years ago, I saw a statue of a Greek woman in Salonica, apparently during uh, the war against the Italians and the war against the Germans in the middle of winter, the men were up fighting the mountains, and the trucks couldn't go up there, horses couldn't go up there. The women carried the stuff. Talk about the women that carried the stuff up. The women carried the stuff. That was everywhere in every town I went to. Not only, and they were the they were the killers. They were the killers as well. Women could do anything, but they had to also be the donkeys. They carried so much stuff. Older women, and I know the statue you mean. And that statue has a woman there, and she's got something on her back, and she's you know she's the freedom fighter woman. And and I think in the land of Athena, this is so so appropriate that that is that is what the women were like. You look at the dominance. Go to your next point. The dominance between Michael and Olga. I would not want to have messed with Olga at any point. Honestly, my sister tells a story that when Olga got back. 1952, it was Australia had the Q culture. This is way before McDonald's. And Olga used to take her to ballet lessons. And there'd be the, the Australian women would stand there in a queue, very, you know, just doing what you did and then moving forward. Olga would go, oh, to hell with this, and just go to the front, give them the shilling and just go in, you know. And all the other mothers were standing there just in the queue because it was just polite. But just to drop a shilling. And then the woman, woman at the front who was, you know, the, the, the bossy woman who just wanted to do it under her own steam. Olga said, no, to hell with this. I've seen death. I've killed people. I don't, I'm not going to wait in a queue, you know. So, yeah, I think we're talking about a pretty strong woman. And, yes, I would attribute a lot of that to how she was brought up, to be brought up in that sort of country. Um, the way I've written about it in the novel is, again, part of it made up about, you know, the things that she's seen and done and the people she would have met. But I think it's a pretty good, as I say, I call it no more than a guess, but a pretty good guess that that's what she would have gone through. You know, in my research, that's the, that's the sort of place the Greek quarter of Alexandria was then. And to my shame, I haven't been there. But I would like... Oh, it would be totally different now. It's 100 years on. But um, I would like to know what that was like. I'd love to go in a time capsule and be back there again. But I've got those photos, which gives an idea, you know. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Do okay, we have a few more questions? Or... It's a really quick one. What languages did she speak? OK. Obviously, English. Um, there's actually a thing in the play which um, that I've wrote that uh, that talks about when the British are trying to decide whether to recruit her or not, and the fact that she speaks German. One of the officers says, you know, she speaks German. That's suspicious. Yeah, well, she was brought up in Alexandria, where you had to. So um, there would be Arabic, French, Italian, German, English, and what's the other one? Oh yeah, Greek. <laughs> Greek. <laughs> so. But, but some friend, well, very likely, um, my mum used to gravitate, and this is the problem with oral history, she said, you know, she speaks eight languages. Hang on, mum, last week it was six, you know. So, you know, there was, you know, that's my mum. That's, that's a bit of an exaggeration. A bit of an exaggeration, yeah. She speaks 42 languages. No. Yeah, no, it's, oh, yeah, yeah. A lot of rubbish. <laughs> a lot of rubbish, yeah. But, but it always was never less than six. And the German, we know, was the way that she got out of trouble. Conversational yeah. people of the language, nothing deep. Yeah. Nothing that they Yeah. I think that's a fair thing to say. It was conversational. It wouldn't be that she could write a novel in it. Yeah. yeah I quote a lot of Egyptians who were exaggerating the mm. importance of the novel. Mm. Yeah. So when you cross examine them, you know. Yeah. 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 Yep. And that's how they learn these languages. The average um, a person growing up in Alexandria at the time would know four, five, or six languages. Yeah. That was pretty, pretty common with uh, all the minorities there, whether they were Greek, the Italians, um, the English, um, the, the, the Maltese, Arabic. and yeah. so forth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. But would know some. And like my mum would say, she was an actor. Well, I mean, how good an actor? I don't know. It was enough to get her saved, but, you know, was she, was she a Jackie or not? You know, I, I'd seriously doubt it. You need to do a lot of years and a lot of shows, a lot of different plays to be really good. So as they say, genius is 10,000 10, hours of work. You know, John Lennon used to say it, and he was right, and he ought to know. Um, she wouldn't have done anything like that. Yeah. Okay, I'll take one final question, if there's any from anyone. 
Well, actually, I'm just curious what happened with Mother Don't know. What, in fact, I'll tell you what, what the, her sister, her real sister, who was Anna, Theana, she, Olga, always believed she put her in to the Germans and that's why she was in jail because her real, her birth sister, Anna, put her in. And this is, I said at the beginning, people did great things in the war and they did terrible things in the war. And Anna, who I knew, she was always a lovely lady and all that, but Olga always believed she was the reason that she was jailed because of that. Mother had Sadeki, never heard anything more about her. Don't know. I wish I had. Mm. Oh, um, I was just wondering, um, when will the play be staged? Are there any plans for it? Yeah, well, this, it's a problem with being an academic. You know, I'm doing, I'm teaching so much at the moment and we had an election night television show that I produced um, that was a national show. There's so much stuff got in the way, hasn't it, Jack? It's just been unbelievable six months since the play. So it will be early next year is when I'm going to be seriously putting it around. And the director, who believes it's ready... Um, is or at least ready to go to a theatre company. He suggested doing the Queensland Theatre Company, Sydney Theatre Company, Melbourne Theatre Company, um, Malthouse, all of those. So, and I'm saying, well, look, there are smaller companies. He said, no, no, start with the big ones. I want to stage it in Greece. That's going to be the big thing. Let's put it on in Greece. Have to go to Greece again. Yeah, I know. Damn. <laughs> Uh, Maybe we'll get it put on in Santorini. So, yeah. <laughs> so if we could talk about the play. So you haven't submitted your PhD thesis yet, is that right? No, no. I keep wanting to, but Chris keeps going, let's just have a look at the literature review once more. Chris! <laughs> so okay, we'll so get it. It'll be perfect. We'll get it submitted, and then we can move on to the Okay, play. so only when you submit that thesis, you're allowed to open this bottle of wine. Oh, Big wow. round of thanks Thank for the good community. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay, you. big round of applause for our speaker tonight. And, uh, and we'll see you in three weeks' time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.